Hey everybody, just want to remind you guys to slide over to staggergear.com. If you use the code STAGGERCAST at checkout, you get 10% off your entire order, whether it be gloves, hats, capes, jackets, anything you need, you can get geared up on staggergear.com. So slide over there, and get your stuff picked out today. You're listening to StaggerCast, brought to you by Stagger Gear. All right, we're rolling with another episode of StaggerCast. I think this is episode number 17. Yep. And we're down here in southern Vermont tonight with a uh, special guest, Ron Bushy. Um, and for those of you that don't know Ron, Ron, do you want to give us a little bit of a background on yourself, just to where you're from, uh, kind of what you do, and a little bit of details on, on your, your hunting past and well, stuff like that? Well, I'll answer your question. No, I don't want to give you any details from my past. <laughs> okay, I gotcha. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've hunted like everybody I was a Boone and Crockett measurer for 26 years. Yep. I was know a lot of people around the country involved in hunting and measuring and big deer. And and I was a very good friend of Larry Benoit's. Gotcha. Yep. So you got a lot of history with the, the old Benoit boys back oh, in the day. Oh, boy, yeah. do I. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Isaac's the one that brought you up to me, and he was telling me a little bit about your story. And, you know, you look around the your office here, and you got some, some crazy heads and, and that you've measured and, and taken over the years and everything. So... There's a lot of stories in this office. That... Oh, there's a lifetime of stuff here, yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. hunted a lot in Saskatchewan. Okay, yep, yep. I started an outfitter in business 25, 30 years ago on an Indian reserve. Oh, no kidding. And I go there every year to hunt. Still to this day? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yep. When do you typically ship out there? Uh, November, beginning of November. Yep. And I drive most of the time because I don't like to fly... That's a long drive. Three days, one way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is long. Believe me. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> but it's a lot of fun. It's all part of the, you mm. know, last year in Saskatchewan. We're getting off track here. I do that all the you're time. Good. Hey. I passed up the biggest body deer of my life last year. Really? In Saskatchewan. It had a broken rack. So you passed it up. Passed it up. Yep. He mm. had five beautiful points on one side, and the other side was gone. Mm. And I had a friend with me in a ground bond that I had built years before that. And he was yelling at me, Ron, shoot that deer, shoot that deer. And I'm just sitting there watching him. And he's looking at me like, what's the matter with you? And <laughs> I told him, I said, I don't want to shoot the deer. I want to shoot the deer that broke his rack. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> but this deer that I passed up, I'm pretty convinced that it would have dressed out over 300 pounds. Dressed wow. 300 pounds. Yeah, because I've shot deer up there that dressed out over 250 and then some. Yep. And this deer was far bigger than anything. Like he had ears and then shoulders. And it was like this thing that was supposedly a neck, but it was so huge that they're just like it bullet, just little didn't marshmallows look it looked like there, a they? Yeah. Like a Hereford bull or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, didn't look like a deer hardly. Mm-hmm. They have to be big to survive the oh, winters up God. there, right? You know, those deer up there, well, they eat well, believe it or not. But yep. You know, and they, they live a long time, or some of them can. So, anyways, we're supposed to, we're not supposed to be, but are we? Hey, I mean, we're always open to a deer story. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. What, what is your heaviest buck you ever took up there, just for? Ah, uh, gosh. I don't remember. Yeah. So, the, that deer on the wall right there, you can't see it here because your camera's pointing to me. See the one with the triple brow tines? Yep. 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 We'll post that. That was probably that one. one of my more favorite deer because I had to hunt. I, I waited hunted i say hunted sat for 70 hours before i shot that deer really and i passed up a lot of bucks before he came along and the thing is i never ever saw him on a trail camera or anything Mm -hmm. that's another thing where i'm not i'm the least technological person you know yeah i've never killed a deer that i saw a picture of him first on trail camera Mm -hmm. every deer i've ever killed that's in this room has been when this all starts beating here, then <laughs> then I know it's time. Yep. Mm. Yep. And and I don't wait 20, 30 seconds to put the safety off on a gun like you see on a lot of guys do it. Well, that's part of your, you know, I put the safety off right away. And when I shoot, it's, well, I got my old Larry Benoit Remington Game oh, Master up there on a, on a wall. See that? Yep, I see that. That's a nice piece up there. I bought that thing in Connecticut when I went to college there. 40, 50 years ago. Really? Because I read a story about Larry Benoit. Gotcha. That was his gun, type of gun. Oh, yeah. Yep. And I s- remember thinking, before I moved to Vermont, I got to get a good rifle. So I was thinking, if that 
rifle is good enough for Larry Benoit, it's definitely going to be good enough for me. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the only the only rifle I've ever killed a deer with. Yep. Except for my muzzleloader rifle. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Is, so, it, is that muzzleloader out Saskatchewan that you hunt with, or is it more rifle? All rifle. That's all. So that that yeah. that's your gun right there. That baby's gone to Saskatchewan more times than most people. <laughs> really? Yeah. I bet. Tell us a little bit about how you first met Larry Benoit and and built a relationship with him. How did I first meet Larry Benoit? God dang it! I I don't. To be honest with you. I'm trying to remember. I think maybe through measuring. He might have been one of the shows I was measuring at. Yep. You know, to be honest with you, I, I can't really say just yeah. the f- crazy thing. I mean, Larry knew everybody. Yeah. But he and I were, we had the same way of thinking, kind of. Mm-hmm. And uh, I used to know how to talk to Larry when I did get to meet him. I wrote a story about a North American whitetail. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, but I used to go to visit Larry all the time up in Duxbury. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and... Um, we always did well there together. One time I went up to his house in the middle of winter in February. It took me about three hours to drive there because it was a snowy day, blizzard. And I called Larry and I said, Larry, I'm thinking of coming up to visit. He said, okay, good. When are you going to be here? <laughs> I said, oh, God, here we go. I said, I don't know. The weather's not good. I said, maybe around noon, but don't hold me to that. And I knew that was a problem because Larry had something set in his mind and that was it. So he, if I said the word noon, don't make no difference. It was sunshine out or two feet of snow. You got to be there at noon. Mm-hmm. So, so anyways, I got there. We spent seven hours at his kitchen table, not in the room with all the deer, and we talked about everything about life and not deer hunting. It's just amazing. Yep. And it's just free flowing conversation, and um, I do remember Larry said something to me. I don't tell too many people this, but he said, someday when I die, I want you to speak at my funeral. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, you know. And that was a compliment that, uh, that's not even the word compliment, you know, just took me by surprise. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so he, I, I don't know, we just hit it off real well. I never tried to, come across that I was smarter than him or more important than him or uh, I, I, I didn't want to necessarily learn from him. I didn't ask him, how do you do this? How do you kill those big bucks? Uh, you know, we just, something that, because Larry was a tough guy to be friends with. I don't know if you know that or not. No. He was. Really? There was a lot of people that were in public and writing and, and, and um, media that he dealt with, but he didn't like, surprisingly. Hmm. So I felt pretty, uh, what's the word, lucky. Honored. Honored that we did so well together. Yep. And uh, so I got a knife here. I want to show you this knife. Yeah, let's let's tear into it. That Larry made me. Mm -hmm. So this is a, and I was telling you guys earlier before camera was going, the thing that's different about this knife, well, not only Larry wrote my name on a knife, but he spelled it the way it's pronounced. I pronounce it bushy, mm-hmm. but it's spelled B-O-U-C-H-E-R. Mm-hmm. But um, I never paid for this knife. Yep. Because he never told me what he wanted. What I did is I traded him some shed antlers. It was oh, his you. idea. Really? I gave him shed antlers to make other knife handles with. Mm. Yep. And... Uh, so he made a beautiful knife. I used it one time to gut a deer up in Saskatchewan, and that's it. Only time ever. Yeah. Yep. So I keep it inside this sheath. It's a beautiful piece. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It's got a, there's a note that Larry wrote me here. I don't remember what it says. And I'm not even going to open it up right now. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yep. So you spent a lot of days up there at the old Duxbury house hanging out with Emma. Huh? Yeah, I did. I, um... I used to go there. Um, one of the things I did, this is off the track a little bit, and I didn't want to get into talking about Boone and Crockett, but 
I was fortunate enough to measure Milo Hansen's world record, typical white-tailed deer. Mm -hmm. And I was good friends with Milo Hansen, and I traveled all over North America with him for four years. And one time I brought Milo up to Larry's house in Duxbury. Oh, really? And I got some neat pictures of Larry and Milo Hansen together. Wow. And, um, it was, you know, it was like no... Larry liked Milo. You know, Larry was not a, a big antler measuring type guy. Mm -hmm. All he cared about was weight, mm -hmm. as you guys probably know that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think what Larry and I got along so well is I was a little younger than him. I don't know, little, let's define little, Ron. Maybe 10 <laughs> years younger than him. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm still part of that old school. Like right now, I can tell you, any listeners here, I'm 74. Mm -hmm. But I think I'm 35. <laughs> That's how my brain works, really. Yeah, yeah. But I know I can't do things. I used to build houses. I can't do the same thing that I used to do. Mm -hmm. But so I never, uh, uh, I guess Larry and I were from the same school okay. in, in that what we, how we thought hunting should be done or would be done. Um, you know, you know, Larry never used a two-way radio or a cell phone or, I mean, I can read you some excerpts from the story I wrote in North American Whitetail. Yeah. Um, and uh, I reread the story this afternoon because I haven't read it. I wrote it, what year did I say I wrote 95. it? 95. 95, I wrote the story about him. About his family, not so much about him. That was the key, by the way. So I called him one day, and I used to do some writing... And I was asked to write a story about him, and I said, "Oh, I know Larry. He don't give many interviews. He doesn't. He he never liked to talk about sit down with one person and talk individually about it. You know, mm -hmm. he had his own book that he wrote, How to Bag the Biggest Buck of Your Life. That was a classic book. I have one of them right here on the shelf, signed by him and all the boys, and." Uh, so he, he was one of the first persons that, that I know of that ever wrote a very good book on how to deer hunt, tracking deer in the snow. Mm -hmm. And that was quite popular, as probably most people who might listen to this would know. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as doing interviews for magazine articles, he was not a keen on that. He was not a fan. And so when I approached him to do a story... And I was asked to write a story about him. I think it was Gordon Whittington at North American Whitetail. Um, I figured, well, I got to get an angle that Larry would wouldn't tell me to go pound sand because hmm. he'd be. I knew him, and so I had to be real. So I wanted to write a story about him and his family, not just him. And when I presented it to him that way. He invited me up to his house and said, come on, let's talk. Mm -hmm. So we spent a lot of time together just talking about things in general. And I never was trying to catch, I never tried to catch him and get him in that gutcha moment type thing. Yeah. And uh, we always talked very casually about a lot of things. And, you know, life and deer hunting all intermingled together. And um, I think he liked that. And I didn't, it's just the way that I talked to him, I guess, you know, it was sort of a natural flowing thing. I never felt pressured. The one thing that I was a little, not scared at, but I worked on him for a couple of years or more because I was, a, I did measuring for Boone and Crockett and other clubs. I, Larry was not a fan of measuring or numbers or anything. Yeah. His numbers were the weight of the deer. Mm -hmm. And he never cared about getting any antlers measured or anything. And um, so one time I was up there, he said, you want to measure some of my deer, don't you? And I said, yeah. And he said, all right, I'll let you measure two. Which, what deer do you want to measure? And I had the answer, boom, like that instantly. I knew what I wanted. I want to measure the deer that was on a picture of the cover of his book. And the other deer I wanted to measure was his father Leo's deer. It was a big Boone and Crockett caliber deer that Le Larry had mounted at the house. From Vermont. 
from Vermont. From Vermont. And so Larry said, okay. So I measured both of those deer. Those are the only two deer I ever measured. As far as I know, he never gave permission for anybody else to measure any of his deer. Really? I have a good friend of mine who knew Larry before I did, and uh, he's hunting out in Colorado now, elk with a bow and arrow, his friend. But he was friend with Larry and the boys, and somehow he got a hold of one of Larry's deer and measured it without Larry's, Larry's knowledge or permission. Uh, but I never never did that. You know, I wasn't that bold of deering. Or, um, but... Um, so I measured two deer and got some pictures of them, of, of the deer as I was measuring them. But, um, you know, Larry just, he was, there's nobody else like that guy. And it's unfortunate that more people, younger people, today's younger people, don't know much about Larry or have no way of knowing probably. Because he was, um, God, the things that he did, and he taught all his boys how to hunt, taught them well. Mm-hmm. And Larry told me something once, and I don't know if he ever told anybody ever. He, <laughs> he said there's probably only one person that he knows that might might have been considered a better tracker than he himself. Larry said he knew one person better than him. And I'm thinking, why? That doesn't. You know, for Larry to even, and I didn't even bring that out on him. We were just talking about stuff. So Larry Benoit told me he thought his son Lanny was a better tracker than he was, Hmm. which I found quite humbling and interesting. It might have been because Larry was getting a little older and Lanny was younger and had stronger legs and could go more. Um, One time Lanny told me he had, Tracked the deer, he estimated probably 20 miles in one day. Mm. Now, that's some serious tracking, you know. Mm. But those guys, they used to, they never had a deer camp anyplace. They hunted out of their home, and uh, they would go up to Maine and Vermont mostly. And it was just amazing how they had the science of tracking so perfected they would um, get on, they would get up early in the morning, like three o'clock in the morning on a perfect snowy day. Like Larry told me, he said in a whole season of month of deer hunting in Maine or Vermont, you'd probably have only five good days of perfect tracking mm-hmm. out of the whole month if you were lucky. And you had to be ready then. And a lot of t- times what they would do, part of their style, and a lot of people may know this, no secret, they would get up early in the morning <clears throat> and they had several vehicles. They would, they had headquartered up by um, um, Rockwood. Rock, no, Rockwood, yeah, but uh, Green, where's Hellblood live? Jackman. Jackman. Jackman, okay. Yep. So they were always in that Jackman area. And um, I could tell you some other stories about that. Anyways, they would venture out from near 60 miles as far as 60 miles away. They weren't just hunting in the same area all the time. But they'd get up in the morning, like 3 o'clock in the morning, and they'd drive logging roads, roads all over. And they'd take a mental inventory of buck crossing, tracks crossing a road. And they would look at the track, examine it. They'd try to determine from their experience how heavy the deer was based on the track, the stride, the width. And then they would keep driving. And they would do that for a couple hours before it got daylight. And then they would, you know, get together um, and decide what track they wanted to go back to or get on. Now, I'm sure other people probably did something similar, but they had a way of doing pretty good. And they would... um, go back to the track they thought was the best. They could probably cross 20 tracks, 20 different deer in a couple hours' time, deer roaming around during the night. And so that's how they could always get on a good track when it was good tracking snow. And then what they would do is they would double team a deer. You know about that, I guess, right? Yeah, both two of them would go. And and, and um, 
that was the amazing part that some people don't know about where they would, one guy would be following a track and the guy behind would always be looking forward. And boy, I tell you, when those guys got on the track, the deer was in trouble. Mm-hmm. Mm. The guy in the back always sees the deer first, right? So that's why. Yeah, that's what, yeah. You know, they, um, they, um, they were phenomenal hunting machines, if mm-hmm. you would call it that. Yeah. Uh, so different than what most of the deer hunting is today that I see on television. Mm-hmm. Um, and. You know, I know, as you were saying earlier, some of that style is coming back with public land hunting and all. Uh, but for them to go up into totally foreign country, mostly paper company land, and, you know, take a big deer out consistently. And they had a way of telling, they could tell how many points a deer had a lot of times. I think Larry was, I mean, this is no secret. You know, if a deer would go down to feed... The antlers would imprint in the snow. They could tell the width, how many points it had. They would look at those details where a lot of people tracking a deer may not notice that. You know, they say, oh, the deer went down to get a fern here to eat or whatever, but they observed everything. They were in tune with everything around them. And I say they, Larry and the boys. Larry tried to teach the boys, Lane, Shane, and Lanny, uh, everything that he knew. And um, they uh, they killed a lot of great bucks. They probably, in my story that I wrote earlier, um, I tried to estimate the deer size. And for the Northeast, as we know, we can't compare the Northeast to deer in the Midwest, antler-wise. Mm. But body-wise and weight-wise, uh, I guess that's where, you know, not to say there's not big, heavy deer out other parts but there's always good big heavy deer and especially maine vermont and stuff and um so they uh they were just interested more in weight more than antlers they like everybody today more or less hunts for antler size and you hardly ever me anyways i hardly ever hear of anybody talking about how much did the deer weigh and the joke that i used to always pass on is the number, the, the weight of a deer is nothing but a figure that can be lied about once a deer is consumed. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But the antlers, once you got the antlers and measure them, you know that that uh, the only way that would change is if they shrink a little. You remeasure them years later. But antler size is more of a another measurement for big deer. Mm-hmm. But so they weren't interested in measuring, but. I, I figured one time when I did this story in Whitetail Magazine that their average deer probably was, I would say, between 125 and 130 inches Boone and Crockett scoring system. And and most of the deer went over 200 pounds. Very seldom did they get a deer under 200 pounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, that, that was their style, you know. And they used to butcher their deer right in the house They came back, you know, you saw pictures of the famous porch with the deer hanging. Mm -hmm. They'd come back from hunting in Maine, and the Vermont season would open, and they'd already have three or four big deer hanging on the porch. And people would always accuse them of us hunting early in Vermont. Eh, You know, the same old thing, you know, jealousy reigns and all. And Mm -hmm. um, one thing I found out about Larry, he was very, very honest uh, and ethical, and uh, you know he he respected uh, you know trophy buck as much as anybody, and he would never think of taking one illegally, if you would call it that. Yeah. Because who would he be kidding? Just himself, you mm-hmm. know. So um, that was a, one of the things about him. And, uh, he cared deeply about his family he didn't give a crap about anything or anybody else he didn't really worry what people said he knew there was always going to be people talking and saying nasty things and negative people with jealousy or stuff but he didn't let that bother him so he was one of a kind and uh boy am i i'm just consider myself 
fortunate that I knew him mm-hmm. and that we liked each other and got along with each other well. Um, just an amazing guy. And, you know, if you saw Larry Benoit in a crowd, you would never pick him out. You'd, you'd never say, that guy, that's Larry Benoit? <laughs> He's just a short, stumpy guy. <laughs> you know, he wasn't physically built like you or anything. Well, you're pretty physically built, I guess, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you look more like a athlete, athlete, gotcha. hunter. Mm-hmm. You, well, you're getting a little chunky there, Isaac. But, Man, my old age. <laughs> so, but Larry was a middle-aged guy most of the time that I knew him, if you say middle-aged. And he just he had short legs, and uh, but the knowledge in his head, I used to say, uh, and I wrote my story that Larry and the boys knew what the deer were going to do before the deer knew themselves what they were going to do. That's how well they, I hate to use the word, hone their skills. That's how well they got to be. That's how good a deer hunters they were. Mm-hmm. They they knew everything when a deer is getting ready to feed and, you know, uh, to, everything. It's just amazing. Um and they got the, you know, they had the, the the deer to prove it. They would, one important thing that Larry told me was extremely important to him was his wife, Iris. She was like, I called her the gorilla glue that kept the family together. And, and I, the one picture in that magazine that I insisted be, not insisted, but I gave a lot of pictures to a North American whitetail, I wanted a picture of Iris, Larry's wife, with the boys and the whole family. Because to me, that was... And I told Larry that. And that's probably why we got along so well. Because he and I thought the same way. He adored his wife. And but she put up with a lot of crap, though. I mean, those guys would come in the house. They'd literally bring the deer. You know, you've been in their house in their room in, in Duxbury? I, I never, you never been. been there. I never been inside. It was a one-room yeah. schoolhouse. It had a high cathedral ceiling. Yep. And um, they had a, a hoist like a block and tackle permanently attached to the thing. And they'd bring the deer right in the house in the living room and hoist them up. And they they had like a table with plywood or whatever on it, if I remember. And they'd cut the deer up right there in the house, <laughs> not outside or nothing. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And then they'd wrap them on a kitchen table. Mm. And they always gave meat away to everybody who wanted it. You know, they shared a lot of their meat. Yep. Uh Am I talking too much of the no, wrong thing? No, 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 you're good. No, this is good. This is good. No, keep, I, it, keep going. Well, it's, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't Did know. they eat a lot of venison, you think? Oh, that stupid phone. How do I turn that thing off? Turn, turn the volume down. There, okay. Sorry about that. No, you're good. Uh, did, what, did they eat a lot of venison, you think? Did they eat a lot of venison? Yeah. Uh, I would guess they probably did. Yeah. I don't think Larry went to... Uh, Price shop or too often to buy beef. <laughs> yeah, Ron, so do you want to tell us a little bit about the story you wrote? I can do that if that's what you want. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I dug this issue of North American Whitetail out. I keep magazines where I wrote stories in. I don't. Re- I haven't read reread this story for probably 20 years, to be honest yeah. with you. Yep. And I wrote it in 1995, North American Whitetail. If any of you guys watching this can see it. Can that camera pick this up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, they see okay. it. So the story, and I'll point it to there. This, I'll try this. I'm not good at this. I'm no, sorry. No, you good. No. The title of the story is A Family Tradition. Mm-hmm. So I have a picture on the top of Larry, his wife Iris, and the three boys, and their grandson. And there's pictures picture of mounted deer on the top here. And then lower on is a picture of of all these racks that never got mounted that were... Larry rearranged his house literally for me to do this story. Oh, no kidding. Because everything was scattered all over the place. You know, and I I didn't... Again, I didn't tell Larry what to do. I kind of... You know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink? (laughs) Yep. yep. Well, here, this is... That's what I had to do with these antlers. <laughs> so this picture here, the house was, this whole wall of these antlers 
was just, it was only like about four foot wide. They added on about eight foot of wall with paneling and, and stuff, and they resawed a lot of the antler skulls in order to get them mounted on the paneling. And they spent over a week just putting this together like this. Just for you to come in? To take a picture. No kidding. And, and then they put all the mounted, or not, a lot of the mounted heads on the other side of the room. Mm -hmm. You almost have to see what that house was like to get a feel for what it was like. And, um, you know, Larry, he, um, he was pretty proud of it. He liked the way it looked after. It stayed like that for years and years. Yeah. And, um, but I mean, who am I to go in someone's house and tell them what you got to do, how you got to do this, how you got to arrange it? Yeah. You don't yeah. you don't tell Larry Benoit stuff like that. You know? <laughs> Would you say he was stubborn? Would I say he's stubborn? Yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. So that stubbornness is a good trait to have as a tracker, right? Well, I guess I would agree there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to think how I can add to that, Isaac. Um, <laughs> stubbornness. Um, my wife is stubborn, but she's not a good tracker. No. no, no. So how's that? <laughs> it's an applied science. She, might, implied. she <laughs> might be listening to us right now. I don't know. She might come in here pretty soon. With, yeah. She'll so, get yelled at after we leave. Yeah. <laughs> I'll catch hell then, boy. <laughs> So, but, uh, you know, Larry was happy with everything we did. And he liked the story. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, I, this, this, I don't know. If, if Do you want to take stuff. us through the story? Take I don't want to, I don't want to bore anybody with words that I wrote 25, I mean, 30 years a lot ago. Of, a lot of people listening haven't heard that story. So if you want to take us through it, take well, us through it. Well, uh, can you Google this magazine? Would it be on North American Whitetail's website um, or anything? It might be, but I'm not sure on that. All right. So anybody listening, it's the December 1995 issue, volume 14, number 8. Gotcha. That's the deal. They can go yep. back to re maybe read that. I don't okay. know. You want to give us some excerpts from it, though? What's that you again? give us some excerpts from it, though? Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, let's see, where, where would I sound? Oh, okay, here's, now I put, I'll just pick out one paragraph that I wrote. Uh, I said, now I'm a resident Vermont deer hunter myself, as well as a measure for various record-keeping organizations. And I've known Larry for many years. However, he really doesn't grant many interviews. This is what I was saying earlier. Yeah. Uh, so when I called him up one night earlier this year, and told him I wanted to write a story about him and his family, I wasn't sure what the response would be. Fortunately, the idea of a story on not just him, but on his sons as well, apparently hit the right button. Larry said to me, and this is in quotes, that sounds good, Ron. Uh, how do you say that? End, end of quote. It was yeah, just a yeah. short thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Larry replied, come on up to my house and we'll talk about it. And so I arranged a meeting with him and, and the boys. Uh, from my home in Wallingford, it's about a two-hour drive north to Larry's home in Duxbury on Route 100. It winds through the spine of the Green Mountains in northern Vermont. Since 1951, Larry and his wife, Iris, have been living in the same house, a converted one-room schoolhouse. It's there that he raised their, their family. It's there that they raised their family. Um, another paragraph. Walking through this house is like going into a museum. It's a whitetail hunter's heaven. Larry goes out of his way to make anyone who comes to visit feel welcome. Larry <laughs> is both generous and kind, and he's willing to share his knowledge with anyone who is seriously interested. The boys are the same way. They just ooze knowledge of whitetails. That's how I felt. Gotcha. Uh, we talked for a whole day. I have been hunting deer for over 35 years myself, I'm talking now. But I still learned a lot during that visit. When you listen to the Benoites talk about whitetails, you come away feeling smothered with hunting expertise. So naturally, I came back a week later and spent another incredible day with the guys. 
This time I took notes. The Benoites can definitely read a track. With snow on the ground, they can tell how heavy a deer is. If he is searching for does in the heat, feeding or getting ready to bed down. Um, I wrote down this. A lot of times they even know how many points are on the deer's rack and the width of that rack before they see the deer. That's because the deer, when they're feeding, they yep, time tip their head snow. Yep. in the snow. You don't see that out in Midwest Kansas too often, do you? <laughs> no. Uh, they have developed a sixth sense, and when they go into the woods on a fresh track, they are truly hunting machines. Their approach to gear and clothing is very basic, as you might guess would be uh, would be the case with the guys who lock onto big tracks and go after the bucks that made them. They use Remington Model 760 pumps with peep, peep sights. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't hunt out of a tree stands, and they don't rattle antlers. I tried to be funny here in this next thing. The closest sound to rattling on a Benoit whitetail hunt probably is that of a buck's teeth chattering. Not from the cold, but from knowing one of these guys is on his track. Ha, ha, ha. right. What a corny joke that was, huh? <laughs> Dang. These guys were trophy hunters years before that specialty became widely popular. They were trophy hunters for weight, not for measurement. Yep. Yep, like you said. That's what I mean. Um over the, over the years, they pass on countless bucks that the average hunter would be ecstatic to tag. And really, do any of these men shoot a deer that doesn't dress out at least 200 pounds? But they don't compete with anybody, and they don't try to impress anyone. They hunt to please themselves. How's that sound? That's Pretty good. good. Yeah. So Very I wrote good. those words... 1995? 26 years ago. 27, 27 years, ago. years ago. 27, 27 years, years ago? ago? Yep. I mean, really, you look back, I mean, 27 years, a lot of, I mean, their approach, I mean, they, they pioneered, you know, the game of tracking stuff. They Not did. much has changed from, you know, you talked about. And the, still, the, still some of the best footage ever tracking. Still is, yeah. It is the, it is the best. Yep. It hasn't been replicated no. since, you know, in 20. No, uh, part of the story I wrote that there'll probably never be another family like the Benoits. No. Yeah. Because just the way society is in general. Yeah, yeah. And the style of hunting and where a lot of hunting is done. Um, now, I do have here one thing that might be interesting. After all the success, I asked, do they have any personal goals? To a man, the Benoit said bagging a buck that would dress out at 300 pounds or more would be nice. Hmm. They have all gotten close with deer in the 260s and 270s. Those aren't calibers. Those are pounds. <laughs> uh, but an honest 300-pounder has eluded them to, to date. Lane, who, God rest his soul, has passed away, who is acknowledged by the others as having been the Lucky hunter of the 80s got an especially heavy eight pointer in Maine in 1987. The dressed out deer weighed 284 pounds five days after it was shot. They said it took us a few days to get him out of the woods, Lane explained. <laughs> oh my we knew he was big, but we were all kind of surprised when we finally got him on the scales. My God, 284 five days after. Can you imagine? It's crazy. I, if I remember correctly, I think he got that on bare ground, too. I think. Was it? I think I remember seeing that in one of the books. Was it 87, you said? 1987? Uh, 1987. Yeah. So Maybe you could, he didn't. I'll have to look at that. Yeah. yeah, I have to check. I know, but I remember reading a story about a heavy one that they got on bare ground. It was, they was talking about how hard it was dragging it. That's a 300 pound deer right there. Yeah. 287, sure. five well, days probably, later. With, yeah. with its guts in, in, it's probably like oh, what? 350. Uh, yeah. That's a horse, That's man. Insane. That's a big deer. I mean, I don't think there's been, what was it? A few years ago, 2017. I think there was a 300 pound buck a in Vermont. Maine. Yeah. A guy Vermont from up shot, that man. way. Uh, or what? Tunbridge up. I think he's yep. from up that way or up North somewhere. Now yeah. when the Benoits would go to Maine, they'd go for the whole six weeks, right? 
Or would they? Four weeks. Four weeks. Uh, well, yes and no. It depended because the main season would always uh, intersect the Vermont season. Yep. So Maine usually, if I remember right, started beginning of November. Yep. And Vermont season generally started middle of November. Yep. yep. So they would try to do both. And I guess they would call home to see if there was snow or whatever. But if it was, hunting was good in Maine, they would stay. Mm-hmm. And I've seen their camps. Oh man, I camps. They used to hunt out of school buses. Yep. Oh yeah. You ever hear that? No. Yeah, that? we talked about that with Lanny pretty recently. Yeah, but it, yeah, he was talking about the yep. bus. That way, he'd say he'd clean out a a big basin. They'd get three or four two hundred pounders, and they'd move to the next one. You know. The uh, one year they were hunting. What the hell's the name of that road? I forget. The Golden Road? No, 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 no. no. Uh, well, the Golden Road, yeah. But uh, south of Jackman, I had a friend who had a camp near Parlin Pond. Yep, Lanny talked about that a little bit. Yep. And um, my friend who had the camp there is friend was friends with the Benoits. Matter of fact, he was with me some of the times I went to, with, to Larry's. And... One time, I remember this, on a Sunday, there was a real bad windstorm. And a Saturday night was the windstorm. And there were a lot of big spruce trees that were blown over by my friend's camp. And if I remember, you couldn't hunt on Sunday in Maine, right? Nope. You still can't. Still can't. Still can't. Yeah. So the Benoit clan, they, they were in a gravel pit about three, four miles from this camp. We all knew each other where we were and stuff. And the boys came over to help us clear the trees on Sunday. And I remember Larry, God, he need a shower bad. Oh. <laughs> and he had his hunting clothes on, his wool Johnson. Well, I can say that, I guess, can Or you can edit that out. No, you're no, you're good. You're good. You're good. You can say it. Oh. And... <laughs> he thought nothing of scent or sweat like that, you know. Mm. He worked in that coat, and I remember we got in the camp after, and we all had coffee after, you know, like mid-afternoon on Sunday, and just talking about deer hunting and stuff. That was interesting. And Larry was just, just like an average guy helping out friends, clearing trees and brush and stuff. And um, I got some pictures of their buses that year. They had two buses, one side by side, a yellow one and one was a burgundy. And they had this big pine log over the roof of, between the two buses. And the buses were parked about, I don't know, what, eight feet apart or something. So that pine log across was their game pole. Hmm. And they had deer hanging from that game pole in between the two buses, like halfway down. You know, the buses are, what, 40 feet long? Yeah. So the poles are probably 20 feet. And, and then they... At the end, I went to see them again when they were all ready to head out to go home. And they had all those bucks loaded in a little smaller, a little Toyota-type pickup truck. Racks and feet sticking out all over the place. What a sight that was. I'm Mm -hmm. sure for anybody that saw that truck driving from Maine to Vermont. (laughs) Old meat wagon. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) You know. But, uh, yeah, those, those were some interesting days of hunting that, won't be replicated obviously yeah you know now larry's passed away iris his wife here's the thing that probably some people may know most people not larry's wife iris passed away before he did and larry told me maybe it was the time that we spent seven hours talking larry and i and we weren't as I was saying earlier, we weren't talking about deer hunting. We were just talking about life in general. And remember Larry told me, he said, I miss my wife. I'm anxious to see her again. So like in his way, he was thinking one day when he dies, he'll see her again. That That's how he thought. And that's when he asked me to speak at his funeral. And um, uh, I, I never did get to go. That's another whole long story, but um, one of the things I regret in my life. Um, but Larry had the pallbearers that his were his pallbearers. I think it was six guys. They were all dressed in the Johnson green plaid jackets. Really? 
Mm. Yeah. And uh, that was a tough time. It was a sad time. So Iris died, Larry died, Lane, the youngest son, passed away a number of years ago. I don't know that much about the history of all that mm-hmm. stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Shane has moved down south playing golf and retired. And Lanny is living, where did you say Lanny is now? He's still, still up in, in Vermont. He's in, living in Montpelier, I think he said. Yeah, okay. Yep. Is he still doing snowmobiles or working on snowmobiles? Still working on them, yeah. Yeah, so we just sat down with him a couple weeks ago at that Huntstock Festival down there. Oh, yeah, down and, in uh, Mass. Chatted with him there for a while. Yeah. Yep. He's still doing some snowmobile stuff. Lives in Montpelier, still kicking around. He's still hunting. Had some beers with him and, yeah. and talked yeah. to deer hunting and stuff. So he's a living legend too, Lanny. You know, Lanny's oh, yeah. killed a lot of big deer. One of the things uh, in the picture in the story, they had their deer. Most of the guys had all the deer they killed. They were all wound up at Larry's house. Mm-hmm. But they did have some of their favorite deer, individual deer, at their own homes, Shane, Lane, yeah, yeah. Lanny. Uh, so they're not all in this picture. But, I mean, I, oh, I wrote someplace in the story about measuring the deer estimating what it would be that was i i forgot about that oh I, let me see if i can find it yeah uh to give you an idea uh where is it uh okay no oh i, I put i'm re- okay i'll pick a spot here um grazing at all the deer gazing did I say grazing? Yeah. That's what deer do. That's cows. what they do. That's what they gazing do. at all of the deer racks on the walls of Larry and Iris's house, I couldn't help but ask myself why they all were kept there. As it turned out, a few of the boys' favorite heads were. Yeah, the Bronites have never had a deer camp. Yeah, we know that. Larry and Iris' house was a natural choice as hunting headquarters. When you're standing in front of the wall where there are more than 100 whitetail racks on it, you feel overwhelmed. Then you turn around and look at the wall full of the mounted deer, and the feeling is magnified. Nobody had an exact figure how many deer these guys have shot over the years, but around 200 would probably be realistic. Uh, If you gave each... Oh, here's the thing. If you gave each of those racks 130 inches for scoring measurements... um, and subtracted an average 16 inches for inside spread. So in other words, no inside spread. Uh, I don't know why I thought of this or this crazy head my upstairs here. Uh, Just antlers, basically. So yeah. uh, you'd get 114 inches of actual bone measurement per deer. Then if you multiplied that 114 inches by 200 racks and stretch that bone out in a straight line, you'd come up with a figure greater than the height of the Empire State Building. <laughs> and just antlers. Huh? And just antlers. Oh, just antlers. That's amazing. Does that give you a, That's a good visual mental right there. image, kind of? Yeah. Uh, wow. I don't know why I thought that or why well, I wrote that's a good, that. It, it that's makes, a good way to look at it. It's a good way to look at it. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of bone for one family of deer hunters. There you yeah. go. All packed into one house. And then I asked them, I said, how many miles have they actually tracked deer? <laughs> the question, <laughs> yeah, just like, the question drew a big laugh, just like what I did. The guy said it would be impossible to figure out. Uh, now, this is me writing this, but I love a good math problem, and based on the number of days the Benoit's hunt each year and how long they've been at it, I think it's being extremely conservative to put the figure at something over 6,000 miles of tracking and that doesn't count scouting or dragging out deer either wow how does that sound it's a lot of miles it's yeah all the way across the country and back compare that to now going to a deer hunting stand on an atv walking 100 yards climbing up a ladder and sitting in a blind for eight hours yeah mm. it's pure not that there's anything yeah. wrong with that yeah yeah this is but different. Just it's a different style of hunting. Yep. yep. So to me, this is what the Benoit's represented is the, probably one of the purest forms of hunting there ever was. And the way they did it, no technology, 
no looking for notoriety, you know, just doing something that they enjoyed doing. A lot of people don't know what that's like to, to be good at something. Mm. But they were they were not only good at something, they were probably the best at what they did. Mm. And, you know, it's fun to try to emulate that or try to do that, Isaac. And, uh, and, and but it's, see, like, I guess I'm reminiscing too much here now. Thinking back of the days of Off the Golden Road, you probably heard talk about that famous. Yeah, yeah. Do you know why they call it the Golden Road? Isn't it because it cost so much money to put in for those paper companies? It was like every mile was a bar of gold or something like that. Well, that's about it, lines. yeah. yeah. Cost a lot of money. It went from Millinocket to the Canadian border. It was about 100 miles. Yep. And I remember when I, I used to hunt there a lot out of some of the gravel pits. Those logging trucks would come by, and those logs were stacked so high. <laughs> and those log trucks... Mr. Man, you want to get out of their way. Oh, yeah. Still do today. Oh. Yep. Because they ain't stopping for nobody. Oh, those roads are for them. That's what those roads are there for. Yeah. Yep. So, but uh, it was a lot of fun hunting up in that country. And I hunted a lot of times up off the Golden Road, and it was fun. I remember one time, not to get in, I hunted, I I picked up a track that looked great at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and I was like, two, three miles in from the Golden Road. And I said, oh, man, I can't follow this track because it's going away from the road and I'm supposed to be working my way back. You know, it's going to be dark in another half hour, hour. Well, like a dummy, I got on the track and never got the deer, decided to turn around. I came out by flashlight and compass. I didn't get out till 7 o'clock at night. And walking down the Golden Road, somebody picked me up and gave me a ride to three, four miles down the road to where my camper, I had a camper at the time. Yep. was. That's how people hunted back then, kind oh, of. Yeah. You know? Yeah. A lot of fun. Yep. Not different than today, kind of. Yeah. You know? No no Onyx. Onyx. <laughs> <laughs> if you said to Larry Benoit, Onyx, he'd look at you like, what the F are you talking about, you know? <laughs> yeah. And... Um, but, I mean, they didn't even carry two-way radios, the boys. Mm-hmm. That's how They carried a pure... compass, and that was about it, wasn't it? What's that? Compass and matches, and that was about it, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know, they didn't, they just went out and, and totally different than what we do today, mm. kind of. And um, fine, you know, they all survived, did well, got big deer. What they did, it may sound primitive to us today, but look at the technology we live in today with, well, you guys know way better than I do. I don't know anything. I mean, but you see the stuff on your iPhone. Everybody in the world's got an iPhone now, it seems like. I get their face buried in it and rely so much on it. And 30, 40 years ago, nobody had that. Or, you know, we, we all lived. And, mm-hmm. and, and those guys, I mean, take a picture of a deer up there. You took it with a camera. Not with a phone. Camera. I would yeah. I, I'd Disposable love to see camera. Yeah. I'd love to see Larry if he was living today, what he would think about today's technology and how hunting is done or mm-hmm. a lot of it. Yep. What now, do you think I'm, he'd say? What's that? What do you think he'd say? That's not the way you do it. <laughs> yep. Yeah. That's what, probably what he would say, something like yeah. that. You know. But uh no, he didn't I don't th- I don't remember him ever criticizing somebody else the way they hunted or where they hunted. He was never one for wanting to explore other parts of the country. What was that? Oh, my knife. Oh. But um, he just wanted to stay up in in the Northeast. Yeah. Now they did hunt in Ontario a lot at the end. Yep. And I hunted with them as I said a couple times up there. Um. And uh, here's, uh, do I have a picture? Oh, see that green poster on the wall up there? It says, on the track. Yeah. Yep. There's a picture of Larry with his orange vest and hat and Woolwich yep. coat. See it up there by the window? Yep. yep. And that's an Ontario deer in that picture. Big old buck. That was a big buck. I think that was a 250-pounder. Was that's that one big, of the years you went with him? 
Pardon me? Was that one of the years you went with him? No, that no. dude was killed before. Gotcha. What yeah. years were you uh, up there with him? I don't remember. It's no. too long ago. Yeah. Now, my friend Craig Jakes, uh, who was a good friend of Larry's I was talking about earlier, used to have an unofficial camp up in Ontario. He put three wall tents back to back to back. You know, the big with the wall tents. And, yeah. And one was for sleeping, one was for cooking, and one was for bullshitting. I don't know. <laughs> and 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 they were for, and the Benoit's hunted with Craig and used Craig's setup and stuff as a headquarters back then. And that was years ago when oh, what's his name? Uh, I was talking about him. That did filming. They were filming the Benoit's years ago. Tom Blaze. Tom Blaze. Yeah. Was hunting there. And um, Larry didn't like people following him with a camera. No. No. I guess he wanted to be just by himself on the track, you know, mm -hmm. simple. You yep. know, no encumbrances. No distractions. No nothing. nothing. Uh, I knew Tom a bit. Nice guy. I liked him a lot. Um, but he was trying to do something that was somewhat difficult, I think. You know, but he produced a couple of... I think VHS tapes, was it? I think they have three, yeah, little VHS and DVDs. And I think there's three three of them out there. Yeah. Maybe okay. I could be wrong. Maybe more than that. Or yeah. I think it's three. Oh, there's another poster with the Benoit's on it there. See that? Yes. What's that one say? That is the New Hampshire Antler and Skull Trophy Club Big Game Trophy Show. Okay. April 13th, 2003. 2003. Yep, and it looks like there's a seminar done by the Benoits. Yep, 2003. Yep. That was the year I ran the Boston Marathon in my old age. Did you? <laughs> no kidding. I wow. ran it in 03 and, and, and 07, Get, getting off the track now, instead of being on the track, off the track. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Well, I ran the Boston Marathon in college in 66 and 67, and I always wanted to do it again in my old age. <laughs> Yep. And I said my old age. That was still almost 20 years ago. Um, but I finished it. Ran it four times. And uh, so 03, when you said 03, that reminded me that was one of the years that I ran it. Yep. But uh, so as you see in this room here, I got memorabilia of a lot of stuff. Oh, yeah, no, it's an stuff awesome, I forgot awesome place. I've had pictures of stuff. Are uh, any of these deer in here from Maine or Vermont? Or what do you got? Uh that six was from up near the Golden Road tracking, wasn't it? Uh, you remember that better than I do. Yeah. That was probably, yeah, that was the main this deer. This one right here? I, yeah, the one that's yep. sneaking out. Yep. That was, was a tracking that? buck? What's that? That was a tracking buck right there? Yeah, I tracked him and snuck up on him and shot him. Took him by surprise. He was embedded. It was a, if that's what I remember, yeah. Snowy day, quiet in deep, deep spruces. Uh, he was feeding on ferns. And and I got within, what, 30 yards of him. And then I remember he turned around and looked like that, like, who are you? What the hell are you doing here? Hmm. And lights went out. <clears throat> yep. Yeah. I didn't... I mean, I tracked deer and killed some deer. And that's my... See that pole with all those little antlers? Yeah. That's my... Early Vermont days stuff. That's your Vermont pole right there? Yeah. Yep. And then a lot of this stuff on the wall of my Saskatchewan days. Come. These are your Saskatchewan bucks Well, and stuff. some of them. Again, too many stories. Those <laughs> three, some of them were given to me that in Saskatchewan. Those, those three on that wall are not deer that I killed. Gotcha. Those three deer are deer that I killed, and all the others around here. Yeah, mm -hmm. those are great bucks. Well, most of them. All those it's up there on the cool beam. Deer yeah, I see you I got them killed. all labeled by year up there. Yep. Some of them. Yep. Some I forgot what year I killed. and You see the fancy plaques I got made for them? I know. those are. That's a custom job right there. Yeah, it Nobody's is. doing it like that. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Took a lot of thought putting yep, into yep. those things. A couple 90-degree so. angles, and you're there, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just picked out wood that looked pretty good and stuff. Yeah. So. 
quick break, then we'll dive right back into the episode. Just wanted to give you guys a reminder about the green growth line of gloves we have from Stagger Gear. They're all available now on the website. You get a fingerless glove, a full finger glove, and a carving glove, which is a cut thumb and trigger finger. All these gloves are designed for northern hunting, so you know you won't be disappointed with them. If you haven't got yours yet, slide over to staggergear.com and use the code STAGGERCAST to check out for 10% off your order. Is that the Vermont mystery buck right there? Yes, it is. What one's this? The, that picture right there. Oh, but yep. you you want to tell a little bit about that deer? It's uh, kind of an interesting I, story. I don't remember enough to talk about it. You don't? No. If, so what I can remember is they found it in a home in Island Pond, pretty sure. Yep. It's like a 232, <laughs> some, somewhere around there, non-typical, but they cannot verify that it is a whitetail or that it was shot in Vermont. Really? Correct. Yeah. No. Kidding. But there's a possibility. Th- it, that would be the Vermont record right there. Oh, it would well, have blown by, the yeah. doors off. The, but yeah. Vermont the, record is what? One, the deer that's the record now is, that's when it's called a milk house. The milk house. Yeah, that was, yeah. I, I measured that years ago. It's own, I forget his name. It was his grandfather that shot the deer, I think. And it was always, had been nailed to a milk house of an old farm in Vermont. And that was yeah. a Norton deer. Way up I on believe. the border. Yeah. yeah. And I measured that at John LaBurge's show years ago. And, uh, oh, yeah, you can keep going. Yep. Oh, are we you out of re- film? No, you're oh. just resetting the camera. You're good. <clears throat> so, part of my problem is I've measured so many deer and done so many things, I've forgotten a lot of them. Yeah. So, he knows the story somewhat yep. better than I do. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I did measure Kevin Brockney's Vermont deer. That was the first Boone and Crockett deer ever killed in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Kevin Brockney, you know that yep. name, don't you? Out of Canaan. Canaan, Vermont. Yep. Shot that deer at 10 o'clock in the morning, standing from his camp porch. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. What that deer score? 170 and 1 eighth. Vermont buck. Jeez. Netted, first, it netted that. Netted? Netted, wow. Netted, yeah. Yeah, Boone and Crockett deer. Wow. He's a got, he's a big beautiful ten to look, pointer. I see a picture I of that. I one. Had a picture of so it son. was the state record until last year, until, yeah. or two years ago. Until that, the milk house buck. There. No, 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 no. These are oh, typicals oh, we're talking typical, about. So typical. Okay, yeah, because that wasn't the one out of uh, what's, what's the guy's his, name? Oh yeah. God, he got me. But he was one seventy seven. One seventy seven. Well, typical. that's yeah. not the net score though. Was it one seventy three? Uh oh. I thought it netted one seventy seven. Oh, maybe you're right. I don't. Yeah. I think it did. It grossed 183. It's big five by five. Giant uh, buck, yeah. What's his name? I can't remember. <laughs> oh, dang it. Yeah, I can't remember. I got remember. this mental thing. A couple of years ago, just for the record, I had a couple of mini strokes. And the doctor told me that I might lose some short term memory. And I did. And it's one of the most frustrating things I got to deal with because there are things that I. New, but I don't remember anymore. It's like took a big eraser and just yeah, went yeah. across my brain. And um, like now in this room, I'll go look through some pictures and I say, holy shit, I don't remember I had that picture. I forgot <laughs> about it. Or that book. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, or some of the stuff, like I said, I forgot about some of the heads that I measured over the years. Um, I'm still trying to think of the guy's name shot the typical i should know i know him so there's that the deer he was talking about that he scored 170 and then the one from last year but there was a bigger one from vermont a typical was it the southern was it down southern vermont no no, no it was the tweed river buck well the tweed river buck okay. found found dead oh okay by fly fisherman no kidding and that one nets in the 180s yeah really? 180 giant 180. typical 180 net 183 i had a picture of that deer where the hell is it? someplace here. you had the rack down here i got well, the whole all time. I, all yeah. the bigger deer ever killed in Vermont, I had the rack shit one time or another. There's a. Oh, it's folded up. Uh, yeah, right, it. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. He's a he's yeah. a giant deer though. Tweed River. That's what. That's like. Uh, the Tweed River is Stockbridge, Stockbridge, Bethel. Yeah, out that way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fly fisherman found it, huh? Yep. No kidding. In the spring, right? I'm yeah. Pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Deadhead. He, just a deadhead. Gary head. Merrill he owned like that deer at one yeah. time. Uh, and then he sold it to F- Phil Osborne, and Phil sold it to another collector, and you know, 
and I measured that deer years ago. It was a big five by five. The G twos, the second point, were quite short. Mm-hmm. Had they been like the rest of the deer, it would have been in the one nineties. Really? Yeah. Wow. For a mamba. But it was like four or five inch points. Hey, the G threes are like just oh my god towers. oh yeah. monsters yeah so yeah. he's technically the biggest typical to ever come out of vermont yeah we know about yeah yeah that was that was verified just that he wasn't killed yeah uh maybe somebody hit him could you be never know you never know went down and died in the brook but yeah big well big beautiful yeah. deer i'm not even trying to figure that out anymore sometimes <laughs> you get stuck on it try- i can't think of his name either though so um sorry yeah. if you're listening i can't remember <laughs> <laughs> that well, that that buck up there, the picture, the other thing's crazy. Oh, the I, Vermont I never mystery heard, buck. I never heard of that story. Oh yeah. The oh Vermont yeah. Mystery buck. Monster. I mean, the top. How how long are the main beams on that? Oh, that, they got to be thirty. They, at least thirty. They have a big 32. spread on it. Yeah. yeah. Unbelievable. Big well, they giant. Couldn't, couldn't verify. It looks a lot like a muley rack, really. The way the G twos um, are, or you know, but it? you never know. And nobody knows the story on it. What's I think his name bought that deer. Um, was he the auto car racer? No. Um, oh, God dang it. See, this Here is goes what... that memory thing again. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Pissing you off. So they even, they did DNA testing on that deer, I believe. And it came back in con- in con- inconclusive. Inconclusive. <laughs> here I go. I'm 26 um, and I, I'm struggling over I'm here. I'm trying to think of the name of the guy who bought him and I know him. He was either a race car driver and he sold, I think he sold a rack to Jay Fish, didn't he? Yeah, I think. And then yeah. Jay wound up selling it. So these racks just get. They get passed around. Oh, yeah. Passed yeah, around and stuff and, and have stories with them and all. But I mean, so, you, hear, you hear some of the stories of people buying racks at flea markets and stuff, and then they end up getting well, them there was, one day. There was one out be, of you know? there was one out of Pennsylvania is that, re- that's, recently. Yes, that's what I'm thinking of. So he was, was Kyrus. There's the picture right there. Yeah, right there. So that oh, was yeah. bought. Pick the picture up. Yeah. I measured that deer with. A Boone and Crockett guy, and yeah, that that's another one of those stories. <laughs> that yeah, that gets me going right there. That's one of the money talks, nobody walks stories. Oh yeah, what's that about? You want to really know? Yes. Uh, if you want to talk, we're we're here to listen. So the Kairos deer was purchased by my friend Jay Fish a few years back from another antler buyer collector, it was definitely determined it was from Pennsylvania. And it was sold by the widow of Mr. Kyrus. I'm I'm vaguely doing the story. Anyways, um, Jay bought the rack. It was a 200-inch plus deer. Knew that right off the bat. So we measured it. I say we, me and Bill Campbell and Andrew Beaudre, the Boone and Crockett guy from Quebec, we measured at the Whitetail Rendezvous show in Ohio a couple of years ago in Marietta, Ohio. It was 202 and 7 eighths. It had, what was that, a six? Let me see the picture. Pick it up for me. Six by six frame. I think there's seven on that. Seven left on one side. side. Well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. A seven by seven, but one of the points on the right beam was really short and out of sequence and didn't fit or didn't have a mate or match to the other side. So Boone and Crockett's rule was it's considered abnormal because hmm. it interrupts the normal spacing. Mm-hmm. So we measured it as such. It still came out 202. And then Jay Fish tried to get Pennsylvania... Fish and Wildlife, to certify that as a state record. Well, they balked at it and all kinds of stuff. They said, no, we can't. We don't No, We don't have a verification. Blah, blah. So Jay said, well, he wound up selling the rack to his friend, who in turn sold it to Johnny Morris, who owns Bass Pro. Mm-hmm. You see where I'm going with this maybe a little gotcha. bit? Gotcha, yep, gotcha. So now that Johnny Morris owns it, all of a sudden, this deer automatically became the state record typical deer from Pennsylvania. Mm. <laughs> so the old saying, you might want to edit this, I don't know. Money talks, nobody walks, right? Mm-hmm. So what Jay couldn't accomplish, somehow Johnny did. And 
You know, it's good. Kyris is the name goes with the deer. K Y R I S S. Yep. Yep. Um, there's no doubt that he shot the deer. He had a lot of other deer. Uh, he died. Wife wound up with them, and stuff happens. I was up to Pete LaJoy's the other day, great taxidermist from Shrewsbury, Vermont. Yep. And he showed me a deer that he had that he was mounting for a guy from New York State. Now, the deer was one of the nicest deer I'd ever seen in a long time. But the story with it was a guy from New York State sort of like uh, rescued the deer from obscurity. He was at a dump transfer station, and this woman was throwing these deer heads away. My gosh. Really? And he asked her, can I have that? And she said, sure. She was throwing away this deer. And I mean, it was a Boone and caliber deer. It had a drop tine on it about that big, dark brown, heavy, beautiful mass, beautiful deer. I think it was like a five, six by six. I don't know what the score was on it, but the point I'm making is, uh, we shoot deer and get them mounted and love them and then we die and then our wives have them and they sell them or give them away or throw them in a dumpster. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened to this one. I know. And so, and it got rescued. I, I don't know the details about it except the point is, you know, like all this stuff, someday I don't know what the heck's going to happen. I'm going to get buried with my deer heads. Better get, get some a tune. Heads? <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get buried with them. Oh, well. Is that weird? <laughs> I've had people ask me for different stuff here and things, and yeah. So you know, I got some interesting replicas and yeah, a lot of I get a lot of pictures stuff mm. away in those shelves that are I haven't looked at for a couple of years that I got to sort through. You, you know, I got pictures of Benoit's house that I don't have here in that folder and stuff. And I just, you know, we all have stuff, don't we? Oh, right? yeah. That's yep. important to us. That's yeah. human. What's that? That's human. Have stuff. Yeah. Yep. Human nature. Where, um, I know this is kind of off track, but where is that little, or the young deer that you said could have been a, it came from Saskatchewan. It had all the non-typical points. I don't see it. You've, oh, you've rearranged things. Yeah, right on the shelf back there. Oh, she right it here. Down oh, my God. Pick it up if you want. Yeah. Wow. I never didn't even see that. That's that a young, was given to me. Huh. What does it say on the back of that? Does it say something? Did I write something? <sighs> it says John Neoth. Oh, uh, Nate. He pronounced his name Nate. Okay. But it's N O E T H. No way. Gotcha. Yep. All red, right. Red so, Red Cross, Saskatchewan. Red Cross. That's 1985. Wow. So. That's incredible. <laughs> for when I small was. Small frame. Everything well, going on there. You said it's probably a You couple remember of, that. I yeah. forgot about that deer. Yeah, you said it was probably like a two-year-old deer. Well, that's the kind of stuff that come out of Canada. But here's. When I first would go up to Saskatchewan, I met this guy in Red Cross, a little bitty town in the middle of nowhere. And. Um. He had this page wire fence out in back of his house that was covered in deer antlers and racks. And he used to collect stuff like that and think nothing of it. That's where some of these bigger heads, that one, that one, and those sheds, those three come from John Noah, same place as this. Mm. Um, that was a Boone and Crockett head right there, but. The middle one? The, no, the one on the left. The oh, one on the left, yeah. But it had a broken skull on it but anyways i used to bring that guy remington ammunition maple syrup and what else i think i brought him a 22 rifle one time and i used to trade him he had farmers used to bring him sheds a lot of those sheds on that shelf were from him yeah Mm -hmm. and they would pick up sheds in their fields and they'd curse at him because it would puncture their big tractor tires yep Ruin eight hundred all tire and all oh, yeah. calcium chloride that was in it would leak out and everything for weight. Mm. And um, so John was an old. He died in nineteen eighty nine, same year as my dad. And um, I, I, I just 
I don't know, where the hotel I was staying at, somebody told me of this guy out there, and I went out to visit him, and, and he said, come on and have a coffee first. We'll talk about the antlers. I remember he had coffee. <laughs> he poured coffee, and there were more grinds in the coffee than anything. It was <laughs> like, oh, it. man, you talk about drinking. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, he would turn out to be a nice guy. I got some neat pictures of him. And he'd give me these antlers, and I'd come back and visit him every year. But he had people bring them, farmers would bring them bushel baskets of antlers. Yep. And he'd just put them over this page wire fence that he had in his yard. It was like 30, 40 feet long, full of antlers. First time I saw it, they were all covered in snow. What a sight that was. Yeah. The whole fence. And I'd paw through that thing and look at it, and I'm saying, oh, my God. He'd think nothing of the antlers. It didn't mean nothing to him. Really? Yeah. yeah. So... Well, but they had a, quite the abundance of them, so it's just like well, how, yeah, how we'd yeah. feel about crows around here. It's the same just, thing. Yeah. That's a good analogy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. the deer antlers to those farmers out there was a nuisance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I remember John said to me something like, don't you have deer in Vermont? I said, yeah, yeah. but not like this. And then he said, like, well, what kind of deer do you have? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I tried to explain to him small ones, you know. So he did he hunt at all? I don't remember John ever hunting. No, just no. just collected the skulls and in the sheds. Yeah, and everything. he was uh, he was like um, uh, he had a junky old square one room house with, and uh, he was a rig. I'll tell you, really was he? lived like in the middle of nowhere in a bush, kind of you know. And, yeah, kind uh, of an interesting guy. Real character to know. So if this, do you think this could have been a year and a half old buck? No. No, two, no. two year old. Well, it's hard to say. I yeah, mean, but if he was two, it, it I could mean, have been two and a half, three and a half. It could have been like a you know upper two hundred inch or like two eighty. Well, if or something. another, you, you look at that, and you give that deer another two years. Oh man, that'd be like one of those deer on. That's like that's like a magazine deer. In a yeah, field. that's. Yeah. Uh, it's well, just crazy at, to see because like if, let's just say in Maine, guys hunt their whole lives in Maine, and if they shoot something like this. It's like, oh my gosh, like, look yeah. at this beauty. This well, is look at the G2 on the right side of that. Yeah. It's got four points going off of it. I know. It's unbelievable. And then you go up to Saskatchewan, and this could be a two year old deer. It's amazing. It doesn't have Bizarre. a lot of mass yet. So it might have no. been two and a half. Two and a half. It's no older than three. But no. You, and I mean, he's got to he, already score in, in the it, high 140s. That? I think I scored. Oh, yeah, it, he scored. He's got pencil marks don't. on it. It's got to be almost in the 150s. I don't 150s. remember what but, yeah, but that's, on it. Right? 140s. One, Look one, at all the points. At least 140, 140, 145. All the points and stuff. Well, see, there's a big, yeah. huge example of a score. Tides. That don't matter. Doesn't J no. mean anything compared to what the deer looks like. Yeah. yeah. You know? Now, I meant to warn you, be careful with that plaque. It's very delicate. Is it? <laughs> it looks like an old piece of pine to me. <laughs> Just like all those other plaques we were talking yeah. about. <laughs> yep. yeah. I'm making a bad joke. I know, I know. <laughs> Shoo! Right over <laughs> so, yeah. uh, so there you have a lot of nothing or whatever, you know. But yep. No, this was great. It's great, yeah. I got. We'll kind of wrap, start wrapping it up, but kind of being that we geared this as, you know, like a Larry Benoit you know, tribute type episode. Yeah. What would you say, whether it be deer hunting or life, what was the best piece of advice that Larry gave you back in the day? Oh, damn. It could be deer hunting or life or one of each. What do you, what do you got? I don't know if Larry ever gave me advice on how to hunt deer. Well, he might have, but I don't remember what he said, to be honest with you. Gotcha. I mean, I never took anything from what he said. I remember him, I don't know if he, this is a different answer. He cared about his family more than anything. Mm -hmm. That's what I remember about him. I mean, I know he loved deer hunting. Everybody loved that. Yeah. But I don't think people know about how much he loved his wife or how much he cared about his boys. And you got a picture of Larry. He's a guy even back 30 years ago, whatever, a, a living legend. And, and you got three boys that all hunt. And they want to shape their own, mold their own personas or personalities. Mm -hmm. And how do you, how do you as a father keep that group together without anybody getting too big for their britches? Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was a tough, tough.
tough job. And Larry was a, you know, um, he probably wouldn't have done well in today's society with all this coddling and different way of political correctness talk and thinking, you know. Mm -hmm. Like if he told you to do something and you were his kid and you didn't do it, you probably got cuffed on the back of the head. He was a tough old boy. Yeah. Yeah. Today, that wouldn't go over too good, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. But he did a good job at keeping the family unit together. And that, that's what I think I take away from him more than any advice he gave me, you know. I can understand your question. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, it doesn't but, have to be straight uh, words, but what you took from him. Um, yeah. You know, he... Um, he didn't have a lot of patience for a lot of bullshit type of talk, you know. No. You couldn't bullshit him, you know what I mean? Mm. He could see right through you in an instant. And a lot of people tried to do that, you know, impress him what, what they got and stuff. He didn't care about anybody else, what they got, what they did. And people would like to try to, I think, try to put themselves on the same level or higher than him because they felt superior but he didn't he didn't worry about that and yep. and that's where you would part friends with him or he would part friends with you not friends but you know people would stop there a lot to ask him questions and stuff and um i guess i think if you asked him about his family and you know work you know what he did for work? I know he was a knife maker towards the end, but what did he do before that? He did sheetrock work. Sheetrock. Hmm. Yeah. Hanging the taping. Yeah. That's what I remember. And that's what Lanny does still. Was it? Was it? Is it Lanny still does that? Yeah, Lanny still does it. Really? And um, so how do you get any more human down to earth average guy? A sheetrocker? A guy that's, what was he, five foot eight, and you know, no, no physical characteristics that would set him apart as a good trophy, not trophy hunter, but deer hunter. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, he lived in a humble house. It was nothing fancy, you know, right close to the road, and. Uh, I made this other joke in a story that I wrote about it's right in Duxbury. Well, you know, what's yeah. the ski area? Is it Jay Peak next to them? No, or? so it's between, it'd be between Stowe and Sugarbush. It's kind yeah. of right in the middle. So when they, I think Larry told me this, that used to be a dirt road that they lived on. And, and his house, was, the schoolhouse was right close to the road. Oh, yeah. You could barely park a car between the edge of the road and his house. <laughs> yep. And and he said when they paved the road to accommodate the skiers, the skiers would drive by the house once in a while, see the deer on a porch and want to gawk and look at it. So as even back then, like today, some people think they're the only ones in the world, and they just stop the car right in the middle of the road. Yeah. <laughs> There'd be a few fender benders on that oh, road I by bet. his house. Someone else not paying attention trying to get to go skiing as quick as possible, rear in the car in front of them, you know, and uh, people used to drive by the house, maybe you know this or don't, just to see the deer hanging there. Oh, yeah, you yeah. Know? It was uh, quite the time. Now, I don't know, do you ever hear of any place like that where there are multiple deer hanging, you know? Nothing, nothing really. I mean, I've heard of people talking about the Tafts up in the Northeast Kingdom before, something yeah. similar to that, but I don't and know on the scale a, of the... There's a camp up in Mount Holly. They used to always, the Wartmans. Oh, Wartmans, yeah. They always used but, to have a pile of them hanging. Yeah. But they didn't have the same reputation as Benoit. No, no, no. no, no, no. And uh, Pete Quinlan, the writer for the Rutland Herald, and do you know Pete Quinlan or of him? He's a guy probably I don't, my age. No. He was friends with Benoit, wrote about him a lot and stuff. And uh, did he do a book on a deer camp? Uh, I forget. A deer camp and stuff. And uh, I got a picture right there on that wall. See that? There's like five bucks hanging right behind the, the yeah, yeah, yep. 
that's in Saskatchewan. Okay. Those are five deer that we shot within two or three days that were all hanging. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of them were 200 pound deer, but they're not on the side of the road like Larry Benoit's was. No. Yeah. So there ain't too many, ain't too many game poles that have, most people get one deer and they get pictures taken and take video of it and then start cutting it up. And yep. you never see an, a, a massive group, not a massive, a group of four or five of them together Big ones, anymore. yeah, yep. no. Right there by the road, yeah, there ain't nothing else like that. No. It's so, iconic. So unfortunately, Larry been gone a number of years now. I forget what year he died. Do you know what year he died? Was it mid mid to early two thousands? I think right. I I, I, I don't I'm know. Not I sure don't off the top of my head. No. Twelve maybe. Was it was it that reason? I think uh, so. Something but, like that. You know. The, yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. It's the there was the end of an era, uh, and you know the house. That place was like a, to me it was like a shrine. Mm-hmm. But a lot of people have said that. Yeah, museum oh, is that shrine. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Good deer hunting. Well, I think for myself, because I knew Larry well, and uh, I'd go, vi- I used to go visit him out of the clear blue just to visit. Yeah. Not to write or mm-hmm. just to talk and stuff. And he, God, I, that's the only thing I thought was wrong with him, that he liked me. I don't know why the hell he liked me. <laughs> <laughs> I was really, yeah. I, I, you know, but um, we enjoyed each other's company. Yeah. And I was just this wet behind the ear kid from, you know, New Hampshire, and went to college in Connecticut, and moved to Vermont. Yeah, and just all the things in my life just funneled me towards. Just happened to connect. Being friends with him, you yeah. know, and um, crazy, crazy. Your life goes in directions that you don't even know till later on, like yourself or yourself. Mm-hmm. That if certain things didn't happen, you, you don't even realize when they're happening. Mm-hmm. Then you look back over 20 years later and you say, oh, if I didn't meet so-and-so and I wouldn't have got married or if I didn't start this company or 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 anything. Like, you know, for me, it started when I was a cross-country runner in high school. My last... Cross country race of the year. I'm getting off the track, but I'll tell you how. Yeah. We had our meet changed from a course in Belrica, Mass, to my hometown course in National New Hampshire. We weren't supposed to run there that day, but the the meet got changed, and we ran on my home course. And that day, I broke our school record by a whole minute. Really. Cross country, two and a half miles, and as a result of that. I wound up going to college in Connecticut. Long story. But I was going to go into Peace Corps. That was my plan. But I started getting letters from colleges all over and changed my life. And I had no knowledge and no mm-hmm. no say in the course being changed, but I broke the record by a minute, you know, literally. And so that changed everything in my life. And I didn't know it that was happening at the time. Yeah, It wasn't until many years later that I realized it. Same thing with me and my wife, you know, fluky thing and everything. But the so butter- you guys will find the same thing. Mm-hmm. In 20 years from now, you look back and you say, oh. Well, they call that the butterfly effect, right? That's, I don't know. That's what they call it. Like everything that happens affects everything else that happens it, from that point. That's it. Yeah. So maybe someday you guys will say, Remember that day we went to that guy Bushy's house and we did that interview <laughs> and blah, blah, blah. And then, and then this went from here and this went here. Yep. This could be that moment probably. Could or, be. Could be a point of... I don't know. Or you think back. You If you tried tonight, you think back of something that happened in your life years ago that is the cause for you being here tonight. Yeah. Like how did you get to meet him? How do you, you know, I'm not yeah, asking yeah. the question, yeah. but I mean, if you didn't meet him, would you be here tonight? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not, yeah. yeah. So. I wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, it's funny how that affect is. everything. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The only reason I know him is because his father used to work for me. Oh, okay. Years ago, carpentry gotcha. work. Yep. And, and, um, 
that was a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's how we got to know each other and stuff. But, yeah, so life's interesting. So those are the kind of things Larry and I would talk about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good points. You know? Mm-hmm. So it wasn't just deer. Yep. No. But obviously deer was a big thing. So, all right, how do we wrap this up and say something smart <laughs> and funny and all this stuff? I don't hey, know. Hey, we tend to, just, we, we tend to just wrap it up. But yeah. We, what's we, that? We tend to just wrap it up. But if you yeah. have something else you want to say, go yeah, for I, it. But I, uh, I, I can't. I, I miss Larry. I miss driving up to see him. Um, nothing you can do about that, you know. No. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got memories of him. I haven't, with, because of my stroke from years ago, lost some memory, but I haven't lost memory of Larry that much. Yeah. You know, maybe mm-hmm. smaller details. Like when I wrote the story 25 years ago, well, there's a lot of shit I don't remember from 25 years ago. But, so, but, um, no, that was, I, I've, I wish I could get those times back a little, yep. but you can't. You can't mm-hmm. stop time. You know, so, well, the, so the good part is, all right, so I got to meet you tonight. I already known this, well. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hear it. <laughs> yeah, what, what am I? Let her rip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I already know him. So, yeah. Yeah. so this will be like a another part of life. And if, if you are able to come to this event in my house in a couple of weeks, yep. something may, be, may come of that. Who, oh, there's a good thing for you. Maybe that might spur something on for you guys later on down the road. Mm-hmm. I don't know. So I hear you. Yeah. We All have, right. We I, appreciate your time. Thank you. Yeah. You do. doing this with yeah. us. It was All right. Good. When are you going to pay me? Go <laughs> <laughs> get the checkbook out of the yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I told you I didn't want, obviously, for the record, I don't want nothing. In it. Oh, yeah. I yeah. don't want this to be about me or anything like that. I'm serious. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. So I just hope anybody who listens to it make laugh at it a little, enjoy listening. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'll bring back a memory of something they knew of the family or of their old tracking days. Or, yeah. mm-hmm. You know, um, I guess the best thing that I could say is if this makes someone else feel good or happy, then it'll be well worth it. Yeah, Absolutely. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, okay. way, good way to end it. Thank Thanks, you. Ron. Okay. Thank you, thank you.